So it's just gone two o'clock on Wednesday the 15th of February and I'm absolutely delighted to be back in the Alma Cafe for the second of our podcast of the Alma Cast. I've got John O'Tay. John, how are you today? Are you well? Yeah, I'm good. Just so far behind with my work. It's crazy, man. Well, that's not what we're here today to talk about, <laughs> but I'm also absolutely delighted and a real privilege and honour from my side to have John Ellis. John, welcome to Back to the Alma Cafe. Ooh, yeah, John Ellis. I am in the Alma Cafe. It's a special place it's, and it's a great honour. John, I mean, you've become a bit of like the furniture here. You've, you've, well, you've come across from KZN, you're sitting here, every time I come, you're always part of the scene here. There's two reasons. Go on. One of them is that it's the Alma Cafe and it's a revered live music venue, blah, blah, we all know that. Second thing is... Food's incredible. I feel like you could say a bit more about that first, but if you'd like. No, nah, whatever. The pies, the pies, <laughs> the pies and coffee, man. There's lots of reasons why the Alma is famous, but let's just touch quickly on what brought you here from yeah. from KZN. We know you're a Derbs boy. Mm -hmm. We know the some of the story, some of the backstory behind you and your previous band, your oh, solo yeah. career. But what brought you from the the KZN side to the Western Cape? Uh, a Renault, actually. A Renault. Okay, yeah. you were driving, <laughs> driving, not walking. Oh. For real, dude, you had to drop in the biggest dad joke of the day. <laughs> it was a Renault. Uh, I it drove it all the way. And, uh, is it a Sandero? Or a Sandero, actually. Sandero? Yeah. Okay, cool. I've been planning a, a movie here for years. My children live here with their mother, and for that's one of the reasons. The other reason is everyone who does what I do in terms of music or you know, writing, in terms of poetry, those kind of things I'm also interested in, all live in Cape Town. Like, all of them. Anyone who did that in Durban has moved to Cape Town, <laughs> which is not completely accurate, but there was a sense of there is a scene here that there isn't really in Durban or Johannesburg. Joburg, there's still something, but, but Joburg friends have told me how much of that scene has quietly just died away over the years, and Durban, unfortunately, lost it years ago. So I felt just more and more isolated in Durban, and it, this is a place where cultural things thrive and I wanted to be in the middle of that and it took me a few years to plan it and get it right wait for my son to finish my trick and all those things now I'm finally here so. well welcome as I say yeah. it, it seems like you're having a lot of fun whilst you've been here we've seen you've been doing some color a lot of pies I've had a lot of fun <laughs> well, a lot of pies I mean you've been collaborating with Jono and his dad who we're yeah, going to be speaking to a bit later it's one of the best to, things ever to, to tell me a bit about that process here's my version um, I've been a solo artist for a long time and it's it's okay, but it's lonely. And there's not a lot of people to play instruments with and, and to draw from a deep well of music in Durban for a bunch of reasons. But in Cape Town, there's the Tates. Well, the Tates own every Martin guitar ever made. And <laughs> they know every song ever written <laughs> from 1957 onward. So for me to realize, first of all, that Richard and John have this incredible chemistry, obviously, because they're vaguely related to each other. And then all this ability, and then uh, these years and years together making music. I just asked one day, I said, would you mind if I sat in with you guys one day? Because as a musician, forget career or money. Just a chance to play music with other people is such a privilege. Especially when, you are, when you've been isolated for so many years on your own in a different city, and there's not a lot of people to play with. He, uh, but here yeah, with Richard and John, these are actual musicians. I, I think John is one of the most gifted musicians in the country. I told him that, so he, he knows that. It still makes it awkward, but no, it's true. You. You're, you're playing your voice, and so and to be able to play music with people who know what they're doing, man, it's a it's a it's a thrill that takes you back to why you started playing in the first place, and you, which you can forget over the years as you just do your own thing. How did you come across us? Because what what was very funny for me was was the first day we met, and you arrived at the door, and I walked up, and I'm like, who's this fucker? Oh no. And <laughs> And you kind of looked at me and, and you're like, hi, is this the Alma Cafe? And I'm like, yeah. And who are you? And you're like, hi, I'm John. I went, John who? And you're like, oh, I'm John Ellis. And I went, oh, okay. I suppose you can come in. <laughs> <That's very laughs> and, then, and then following that, it was a case of, well, and, and this is just my sense of it. And, and, and if this is wrong, by all means, correct me immediately. But the sense was a bit like, well, I've moved to Cape Town. Somebody told me to get to Alma Cafe and come and chat to Richard and John. Mm -hmm. Who the fuck was that? It might have been Nibs from the Spay, actually. Oh, that explains it. It might okay. have been Nibs. And I'd always known about the Alma, but I didn't really know, understand it. I just heard this, this legendary place <laughs> in Cape Town, you know. And then, and then Nibs said, John is amazing. Here's John's number. Okay. So I came down to meet you, and the next minute we were in a band together. Because yeah, it's, it's always <laughs> weird. You know, we've been, it's that thing of, it's not familiar, f familiarity breeds contempt, but like, familiarity maybe breeds a complete lack of perspective on what it is that we're doing yeah 
Where for me, I rock up here every day and go, oh, okay, I've got to do stuff now. <laughs> you know, but for the outside world, the Alma Cafe represents something that, that I very easily lose sight of. And you're coming in and, and finding us and being like, oh, hey, I found you and let's chat. That just kind of jogged in my mind like, oh, yes, of course, there's this thing that we're doing that's a bit bigger than... than there's two things. Us, you know? There's two things here. One of them is you can't see it if you're listening to this podcast. It's a fairly small room, but if these walls could talk as the cliche goes, there's been so much music here for, after how many years? I oh, like 13 now. There's been so much music in this, in this space. It's just dripping with music and stories and talent and you get that sense first of all this is a sort of a hallowed ground and then the second thing is okay. you and your dad are actual musicians not people who who are hobbyists i mean i know a lot of musicians in the country who call themselves musicians and they we won't mention their names so they're, what they're, so what they're defines, making fortunes what defines that that idea because I, I this is a conversation i love having and i think it could be interesting what makes for a musician as opposed to a hobbyist? What is it that you, those you and your dad infuse you and your, songs with? You and your dad play music because you can't do anything. You have to. Okay. Like it's in your blood and, you, and, it, and the way you express your creativity who, as who you are as a person comes out in music. So what, well, I, I experienced the same thing I with you. I feel the same about myself. I, yeah. When I discovered music as a 10-year-old, whatever it was, I watched Elvis on TV and I thought... Really? I want to be that. Elvis is the guy who got you. Elvis is the reason I play music. What? Which is weird because he, if you think about it from a historical point of view, he was not even a very musical guy. He didn't play much. He didn't write anything. But yeah. there was something about watching this man with a guitar communicate with his body and his singing that made me go, oh. And then yes. and this, quickly after that was the Beatles. You and your dad have the same thing. You got the same deal. You'd be playing music if you were earning money from it or not. You would have to play music because yeah. it's just in you. And you play so beautifully, you sing, your voice is incredible. And you and I are, the, are brothers in that space, don't you think? Yeah, we, certainly. Well, that's, that's why we we'd, play we'd, together. We'd play here if, if there was a full house or if there was two people. Totally. Because I mean, we play here, we rehearse here because rehearsals are fun. The rehearsals <laughs> are, forget the show, the rehearsals are great. Yeah. It becomes the, the, the audible byproduct of a good interpersonal relationship. Yes, but also, but for starters, before you have the interpersonal, you have to have that first sense of, I was born to do this. Yeah. Then you find someone well, to that communicate just becomes, with. That just becomes, it's the language, it's music yeah, as a language thing. Yeah, but it? yeah, but don't take it for granted. There's very few people who feel it. There lo there's lots of people who play, but very few people feel that compulsion, I, I reckon. Okay. That's why this music industry is so full of people who are not really musical. <laughs> I think it's an important point that, that's been made here, which is that sometimes, Jono, we've talked about it off air as well as touching on that first episode that this is a special place and yeah. there's a, it's special people who frequent it whether they're the artists on the stage or the audience that typically comes this is not your normal audience say eh, john well that's the other thing that's the other thing this is the third thing i realized what makes this place <laughs> that so special is true. so audiences in cape town are acculturated socialized into experiencing and wanting to experience live music i don't come from a city that does that okay. unfortunately so when I play at the Elma and people are sitting listening, that's a bizarre idea. <laughs> Look, that was, I'll say this, that was something that, that my folks insisted on from day one. Yeah. We start, we, back then we started every show with my dad making an announcement, phones off, sit down, shut up. Yeah, but that people actually listen and to, the, 13, to your dad. Yeah, and you know? 13 years down the line, we don't have to make the announcement anymore, but you know, traditions are traditions. Yeah, like people just people know the lights go off, the room just shuts down. It's, it's amazing. We've managed to create a, a theater in a like funny little blue box, basically. I've got to tell you how rare that is because I mean I I love Durban. I love Durban people, but they're not a society or there's no culture there of sitting and listening to music yeah. anymore. It used to be, but it's gone now. What was your first impressions when you walked in here? You came looking for the Ellis clan. I mean, well, yeah. What did you, I, when, you when you were like, thought, is, this, is this it? Or was like, wow, this is something. No, I thought to myself, <laughs> Elma Cafe, it'll, it'll be great when it's finished. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing that Tate family has. There's a sense of cozy familiarity about it that makes me feel instantly like I kind of belong here. 
And it took me a while to convince Johnny that I do actually belong here. <laughs> He's still not sure. <laughs> You're still paying him on the it's, monthly basis I'm to get like, in there. Yeah? Please okay. accept me. <laughs> <laughs> in the first show that you did with, I think the first one was with, was it with James? No, or was actually, it, did I, you do a solo? I tried solo to do night? a solo thing, but, but Johnny didn't think I had enough fans and he was right. And uh, I, play, I opened for somebody else. <laughs> People do know me from my previous day job, which was Tree 63. I'm not really a, an established solo artist, even though I've got 10 years behind me. For whatever reason, it hasn't really happened for me as a solo artist. So if I did play on my own here, I, it would take some convincing to get people to come. You know? Tell us a bit about the work that you're doing with James. You've seemed to pick James Stewart. Well, that's the other thing. I mean, Cape Town's so full of people to collaborate with, and I'm just not used to collaborating because, you know, like I say, most of the people who I admire live here. <laughs> I hadn't actually met James before I knew about his band, The Usual, and all that. When I was in Tree, we used to be kind of jealous of The Usual because he had this similar high voice, and I thought I felt competitive. But I now realize he's just a nice, normal guy. But he, he, he suggested we do something together, and we did, and we tried it Did out. you guys actually not know one another? No, we only met this last year. Wow, is that right? Yeah. You wouldn't, know, you wouldn't know it when you're watching That's on so stage. Cool. Well, he, he knew my music, and I knew his, and, and he'd been covering one of my songs for years, which was a huge Which honor. one is that? Million Lights. Million Lights, yeah. Oh, shit. He doesn't do very well, but he... <laughs> He tries. You know, he's next. <laughs> he, he speaks very kindly of you, sir. <laughs> James is one of the best cover versions I've ever heard of my own song. <clears throat> your, no, he, your version of Born in a Storm was special. Well, you sang his song. Well, that's just because I, I'm better than him oh, on, on every level. Although he does have the he does have the best hair in rock and roll. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, James is a James is a lo loveliest guy, talented. Gr I mean, that's that voice of his is just incredible, and it's just so great to be able to collaborate with people. Nice. Who you feel I can stretch you and and challenge you as a musician, right? Totally, and, man. And pull you somewhere higher than you used to be. Yeah. And we all feed off each other and and grow together. And it's, I'm so surprised yeah. to hear that the the collaboration thing for you is so new because you yeah. just slot so seamlessly into doing it as if you've been doing it your whole life. I didn't. Are you just very brave? Yeah, I'm pretty brave, but also I'm sick and tired of myself. So it, so jumping into a, a collaboration is. You dive in with both feet because you're so happy to be playing with someone else, right? Yeah. And also, the whole point about collaboration, don't you think? It's an art to it. You've got to go in prepared to come second. If you go in expecting to lead it or wanting to drive it, yeah, you're going to clash with people. But yeah. to go in on the back foot and go, I'm here to learn, is, I think, essential because it opens, it lets everyone else know that you're willing to just not have to drive the thing and be in charge of it. There's all those control issues, the ego that we have in musicians. How, how is that collaboration different now, John, as as in 2023 than it was, for example, in 1999 with 363, collaborating with your two bandmates there? How, how is it different now to what it was when you were sort of seeking well, a particular outcome? I think because when you get older, you, you've realized that hopefully that life's not about you. You've realized that. Right? That's like a major lesson one. Your life's not about you. When you're younger, you you're driving everything because it's well it's my band my songs which is always nonsense but that's what drives bands apart eventually because you put yourself in the way when you get older right rich yes you can you hopefully have learned that you can take a step back and go i'm here to learn something rather than here to achieve something for myself but also unfortunately like john will know this i think you'll agree we we live in a generation where music's a full-on like full body contact sports, it's competitive. You have to be ambitious and driven to succeed in it. And the older I get, the less I'm like that. It's so much negative energy it mm -hmm. goes into competing with other musicians and trying to totally. win at all costs. And we need to step away from that and just listen to music and play for, this, for the joy of playing. That's when the joy comes out again. The reason I'm asking you that is because I, I would have thought that that competitive yeah. part of it is part of what builds a scene, a, a brand, and ultimately a quality behind it. Yes, but those three words you just mentioned are great words, but they're also text that got to do with commerce, capitalism, and, and I don't it's mean that horribly. It's a marketplace thing, yeah. and those, those are essential things. But I've never really thought of music in terms of the marketplace, and that's why I don't feel like I'm anywhere near where I thought I'd be at this age. Because I just don't have that, that drive to just you know, to beat well, other musicians utter, at all costs. The you know? utter ruthlessness to climb yeah. over anyone's face and stand on anyone <laughs> that gets in your way. Is that what took you to the States the first time? When I say the first time... Be careful that, what I say here. So we, we, had a man, we had a manager who was very ambitious, very driven, and very good at that stuff. 
and it, the relationship didn't end well. And there were a lot of feet stepped on in America even. And people were wary of us, these South Africans, because they had this manager that was tricky to work with. But as much as he was tricky to work with, he definitely got us places we wouldn't have gotten our own. Mm. Because you do, like John said, you need that ruthlessness. And you, you, can be, you can be passionate about your own music, but ruthless is another level. It's got nothing to do with music. It's like there's a, it's a market you, driven well, thing. It, I mean, ruthlessness, I would say, is, is absolutely the anathema to what music in the way we've just described it 100%. is actually about. Because if you're, if you're deliberately approaching music with, as you defined it, wanting to come second, yeah. that's the anathema of what ruthlessness is about. I'm one of those naive you know? musicians who used to think that your talent would be enough. But your talent really, unfortunately, this generation especially, is, is just the key in the door. Stepping through the door and surviving in that next room takes another whole level of skill that I don't yeah. think has much to do with music or creativity. No, it has everything to do with communications and branding. Yeah, and I've just not, those things don't interest me. As a musician. John, something changed though. You say that there's not the link between the music, but again, as somebody who's listened to your music for 20 years now. Oh, wow. You, you um, need to change So, so, so yeah, them. thank you. My, the check's in the post, right? <laughs> you, your, your music changed. That first solo album, oh, yeah. it was an angry album. I mean, yeah, come well, Out Fighting, yeah. from, from Tree, which was very melodic, to Come Out Fighting, mm-hmm. the, the various songs, the lyrics, the sound, is it's hard. Yeah. It's, it's, so I mean, clearly, that part of that journey has been trying to find yourself beyond that original scope of what 363 was about or what you thought it was going to be about and how it ended. Am I, like I right it. or am I it's true. reading I, I, stuff but in But I think I like rock and roll, you know. John and I were talking about this. We play acoustic guitars, which is rich, and I love that music. But there's also an element of rock and roll that still excites me because it's a passionate medium. It's a passionate mm-hmm. form of expression, right? You plug electric guitar into an amp and you hit it and it makes you, makes you want to say it. There's an urgency about it. Mm-hmm. And I, I really love that. And... I think the goal of musicians is try to is to try and keep expressing yourself with those same tools, but in new ways every time. But to keep that passion alive, otherwise it becomes a bit formulaic. You know, I mean, I'm a huge U2 fan, but I don't think they've released a, a passionate album in 20 years. One of the reasons U2 I, don't, I think are not that so exciting anymore is because they're millionaires. So listen, what, not, do you, what do you think? Of, I, I just want to drop this in as like a complete aside because U2 is one of those kind of uh, love to hate bands. For some, most looks like most people just these days hate them. But I, I love them. I grew up in the... You grew up in the era when they were the biggest band in the world. For me, Joshua Tree was a brand new album at a point in my life, right? Yeah. yeah as, it, 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 I was 15 and I was on the verge of changing, you know, you, you, oh, hormones geez. and all those things, testosterone, and that album came out. Yeah, I mean it, it's it defined an era, but everything beyond that, I, I think. Did you ever listen to Hard to Dismantle and Atomic Bomb? Though? Yeah, that's the one I think is the last good that's one. That's the last great one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. So we agreed there. I grew up listening to a, a best of oh, 1980 yeah. to 1990. Yeah. Um, which had all that early stuff on it and obsessed. I mean, one of no, those totally. one of those things that I just listened to over and over. And but what do you look again. for in music? What do you look for when the you listen? The drummer. It's always the drummer. If the drummer is great, then I'm into it. Yeah, it's true. A drummer is a, a like to band. me. To me, makes the band, and I and it took me a long time to realize that yeah. as well. So you're only as good as your drummer, I think. Totally. And <laughs> and, and uh, Larry's a Larry's a robot. He's a martial robot. Well, that's why I love the Police. Um, Stuart Copeland is one of the best drummers. Don't give me that look, people on the podcast. John has given me a look. Yeah. Stuart Copeland is one of the most lyrical drummers. Now I mean that sincerely. Hi hat king. Ever. <laughs> Dude, don't even. I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I think you do need to leave just now, John. I do but need to leave. Just a couple of things as we work towards a wrap. And the rest of 2023, mm. uh, I know there's a couple of things changed up. From a music point of view, can we expect? Something I was saying earlier. You, you can't <laughs> Our s- album? Yes, well, John and I are doing an album. We <laughs> haven't started writing it yet. But <laughs> What could go wrong? Is that the title? Oh, fuck, <laughs> what could go wrong with Volume 7? That's the name of the album. Uh, uh, songs from a bathroom, which is our opening title, talking, Pissing in the Wind. <laughs> talking about being compelled to play music, whether you, whether you make money from it or not. I can't stop writing, even though I've, I've tried to for years. I don't know about you, but the, right, the songs just come. I struggle a lot. Though. No, it's not easy, but they come anyway. And, the point, and what you go, especially in 2023, when you go, you almost go, there's no point in recording an album anymore because no one's buying music anymore. People are streaming it, which is another whole podcast. But... You can't stop as a creative person the, the song was coming. Mm-hmm. So you end up stockpiling with these things and going, I could make an album. I don't know why, but I can't stop writing. So in 2023, I'd like to make another album. 
I just don't know. For the first time in my career, career, for the first time in my life, it's it's expensive to make an album. I can't afford it, and I, and there's no return for it. So you, it's a strange. Labor of love. What about selling space? your? What about selling your your material? Getting a publisher on board and selling it. Do that. I'm already bored. That work. whole sentence just bored me. <laughs> because Fair it's, enough. Because it's about selling, yeah. and I'm going. When I mean, you, unfortunately, so, so when you finish making a demo, you really feel like oh, I've, I've finished. That's my job done. So Why the fuck should I make a demo and then sell so, it to someone? No, else? for sure. So, so, <laughs> so I, mean, I guess is, is it, you know, also to find someone else who's going to pay a lot of time. It's like a painter. If you paint your canvas, you finish. You put the last bit of paint on it. As an artist, you think I'm done now. When you then you put another hat on of trying to sell that, that's a different hat, and I don't have that hat. <laughs> but I mean, some lessons from last year. Last year, you released Native, which I'm guessing mm-hmm. would have taken quite some time to put out. Yeah, but, I mean, are there lessons learned from that process, and if you do it again differently? Yeah, yeah. I think the lesson is don't have any expectations to make a living from music anymore. Which is strange, since I had a career once where I made a living. That's gone. And now uh, you, you go, do you still make music, or do you give up music completely? And and people like John and I can't give up. Because sure. it's in our blood yeah, you know, and rich. As opposed to people who go, well, this career didn't work out. I know a few musicians who go, well, this career didn't work out, so I'll try something else. So I had a career earlier as an artist who wrote his own music, right? Yeah. I can no longer make a career out of that in this country, probably anywhere. I've come to terms with that. What I'm saying is I still can't, I can't stop thinking about new songs and ideas. Yeah, I mean, that even kills though, me because I'm going, but, but you're better than you've ever been. Well, thank you, but uh, I mean, obviously, it's I'm experience, you know. I'm, I'm freer now. I mean, I don't put so much weight on being an artist anymore. There's so a you're purity free, that comes with you're much freer when you are not yeah. having to write to yeah. a manager's deadline or, or an album contract or whatever. Yeah. You can write yeah, that's, from that's, the real place of where write where see, real writing happens. That's why you love the Elmer Cafe because things like this happen, and these two gents speak wisdom into your life and, and inspire you and go, "Oh, it's actually worth." Trying another day. <laughs> well, there's certainly there's certainly an authenticity and a real integrity behind everything in this building. The people, the place, well, the music, and, and those who come and I say support it. Not for nothing that in this entire huge city, the mother city of South Africa, right, the most popular city in the country, one of the most famous cities in the world, the two venues that are left that people talk about are, are one other one we won't mention and the Alma Cafe. And the Alma Cafe hasn't Let's got... Let's definitely ven- mention that we want to support. Are we talking about Cafe Roo? Yeah, okay. Dude, Cafe Roo is amazing. We okay. love them. Well, we can mention that. But the point is, you would expect it to be this multi-million dollar theater. No, it's not. It's the Alma Cafe. People want to play here. It's sure. amazing what you guys achieved. And we're going, to, we're going to talk a bit more about that with, with Richard now. Looking forward to that conversation. But John, I know you've got commitments this afternoon. Yes, yeah, so I have to go get my hair done. There you go. The hair, <coughs> and, the hair, um, the hair will take a while. I think those extensions need... Yeah, my fringe keeps getting in my eyes. <laughs> <It's long laughs> time. But John, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. It's been an absolute privilege. This has been something it's I've... great. Look forward to this conversation for 20 years. You got, you. you got my <laughs> bank details, right? Bank details, yeah, checks in the post. John will make sure that you get your own very own stage soon enough as yeah. well. Well, I think I deserve it after so many years of being a good man. But thank you, guys. I've had a great time. Thank you. I hope I get to play the Elma Cafe one more time. <laughs> Bro, you literally oh, book next book. month. Yeah, so for good the point. record. See you next month. The what shambles on there. What do we mean? The 26th uh, uh, of March. You ready? While we were rehearsing in here, somebody walked in and said, this sounds like a shambles. So we're apparently the shambles now. She's actually here. Oh, that's right. It was, it was you. <laughs> she, she, used a, she used an adjective before the shambles. That was me. Uh, so our goal tonight is to prove that this is not a shambolic episode. And in fact, you have spent money wisely. <laughs> a shambolic episode. <laughs> that was a rehearsal, folks. For those of you who don't understand it, like what music looks like in the background, that was a rehearsal. <laughs> There is one person here tonight that knows what that means. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> The shambles, we're the shambles, we're the fucking, fucking, fucking shambles. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, one, two, three, Started, it's a <laughs> 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 That's too slow now. Okay. <laughs> 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 Bless my soul. <laughs>
in cahoots. <laughs> yes. And uh, it's a great thing for me. Uh, Durban is a lovely place, but there's not a lot of... In fact, everyone who ever played guitar in Durban moved to Cape Town. <laughs> I was literally the last guy. <laughs> It served me, uh, served me back at you, John. Thank you for. Uh, no, no, no. This is an coming. opportunity to to pump. I, I really mean this. Cape Town is a, a lucky place to have these two incredibly yeah. talented yeah. people. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're about you just now. <laughs> we'll, we'll make a big deal about it in two songs' time. Oh, <laughs> I genuinely meant that, but now it's fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. And back at you. Back at you. No, no, no.